Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I don't think you're happy, as happy as I am to be here today. The little, the little last tidbit. Maybe, maybe we'll be seeing a lot more of you all in a few weeks. Uh, the Conways, Tammy, Pastor, Israel. Wasn't that, wasn't that wonderful? Excellent, excellent playing. Gabe and Angel. They've got, like many of you, they've, they've secured a, a special place in our hearts. How many of you uh, are with me with that? The Conways. My wife and I celebrated 15 years of marriage on August 3rd. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's some consternation surrounding that. We won't get into that. That's a whole other sermon. But we made it 15 years. How many of you have been married more than 15 years? Just, just, just say, thank God. Thank God, all the foolishness, all the craziness. 15 years, and Pastor Conway and his wife, they, they mentored us, counseled us. We had uh, pre-marriage counseling, before marriage counseling. I don't think you can get enough counseling for marriage. <laughs> you need some regular checkups. And I, I feel a sense of um, it's a solemn feeling that, that God saw fit to surround me with such individuals that, that I, I never thought I could be married this long, and I never thought I could be a father this long, and, and God has blessed me to have two sons. Yeah, they'll, they'll peel your eyes open in the morning when you want to sleep a little bit. Yeah. I, I'm, so, I'm so thankful to be a Christian. I'm so thankful to be a part of the Seventh-day Adventist church, even though we've got all kinds of issues. Let the church say amen. amen. Yeah, just get it out. God has raised up this church as a movement, not a denomination. And this church has a purpose in this world to call people back. They're Christians everywhere. Amen. Amen. In the Catholic Church, in the Lutheran Church. But God has given this church a very special message to redirect the attention of his children back to his word. So I'm more than grateful. In spite of all the, I, I hear the issues. I, I, but I'm, I'm here. I'm not, I'm not going, by God's grace, I'm not going anywhere. How about you? Same thing I said. August 8th. August 3rd, I'm getting in trouble already. <laughs> in front of all those witnesses, I, Andrew Bailey, promise in sickness and in health, come on church, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, till, till, till death do us part. That promise can only be kept by the amazing power and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And your decision to follow Jesus can only be kept the same way. And so I, I, I have been, I'm like a, a racehorse in the stalls. I have been so excited to preach this sermon. Uh, you know, I, and, and I've, I'm, I'm, I've prayed that God will help me constrain myself to these eight verses. Because I can get carried away. I, I, I'm, let me tell you, I can sit and talk to you about this verse for the next, I'm telling you, for the next 14 days and keep on going. I know that God has a message of blessing for every single human being, being here and those who are watching online. Because the title of the sermon is to take up your bed, not the pastor's bed, not your wife's bed, not the conference president's bed. Take up your bed and walk. And if Jesus said it, that means he's already given you the capacity to walk. When God created Adam and Eve, he blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply. God always gives you the capacity before he gives, he gives you instruction. So every command of God has already been given to you with the blessing. You have the capacity to walk. But this story today in John chapter 5, is a story that every single human being here today, old and young, Christian, non-Christian, can relate to. The 
because it's the story about being stuck. How many of you know what it means to be stuck? Mm -hmm. I've been now uh, an automotive designer for 24 years. Mm. Six more years would be 30 years. Don't look too bad, huh? <laughs> 24 years. I was baptized at the Farmington Hills Church in, in 2004, so I've now been a, Seventh -day Advent, a Christian Seventh-day Adventist for about 15, 15 years or so. Mm. Been married for 15 years. I'm not sure where you're at. I'm not sure how long you've been married, how long you've been in the church. But I tell you the truth, this story is not speaking in past or future tense. It's speaking in present tense. What tense, everyone? Present, present tense. Every single one of you he here today listening is stuck in some area of your life. Stuck. You can't move forward or backwards. And that one thing, how many things, church? That one thing is affecting your whole life. Which is why the question of Jesus, do you want to be made whole? And so let's, as we dive in and explore what great and wonderful things God has done for us through this passage, I just want to ask that you pray for me. We pray together that God would, would bring out what he needs to bring out for us individually Amen. so that we can start moving. Are you with me? Let, let us have a word of prayer. Lord, I, I am so humbled, grateful. I stand in awe. We stand in awe because God saw it fit to take we mere mortals with all of our weaknesses, all of our defects of character, and you've chosen us to present to the world in our lives and in, and, and in our speech the most perfect message in the universe. We need you. We ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us and teach us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. John chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Have you found it? Are you there? <laughs> After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem, I'm just going to use the, I'm going to abandon PowerPoint. We'll just use our, our Bible. Now there, verse 2, in, there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. John, in this first verse, is revealing to us that there's a whole lot of people in Jerusalem on this particular occasion. A feast of the Jews. Are you with me? Passover, you've got Pentecost or in-gathering, you've got the Feast of Tabernacles. There are several different uh, feasts that the Jews celebrate even to this day. And John wants, us to let, wants to let us know at the beginning that what is taking place or about, about to take place is taking place in the context of Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people that have descended from all over the Roman Empire, certainly all over Israel, and they're all there crammed into Jerusalem. Are you with me, everyone? Second thing he wants us to know that there's a pool or pools, as I was doing my research, the pools of Bethesda. And at these pools, the Bible doesn't say there was a multitude. It says that they were, what everyone? In your, in your Bible, what does it say? 
a, a great multitude. Now, a multitude would be enough. Are you with me? It simply means that as you look at the crowd of people, there are just too many people to count. Multitude. But a great multitude, it, it, you, don't, you don't even bother. You, you're not even thinking about counting. And so in Jerusalem, which was packed tight with people, there was just north of the temple, north of the outer court, court the north entry was the sheep gate. So as you entered into the outer court, you, you could not pass by this horrifying eyesore of human beings gathered and pressed together in Bethesda. Now, if you've studied, you've broken out the lexicon, the Hebrew and, and Greek lexicon, you would, you would find out that Bethesda translated ironically or paradoxically house of mercy. House of mercy or house of grace. The definitions, as you dig deeper, it, it, it means a place where the sick are received and cared for. In our modern language, that would be a hospital or a church. Feast of the Jews, packed. The pools of, pools of Bethesda, packed. It's the Sabbath day. And the question that John is raising, the question the Holy Spirit who inspired these words is raising is, where was the mercy and grace on the Sabbath day all these people packed together? You see, the priests, the Levites, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, these men, they passed by the pools of Bethesda and they did not correct this myth and legend that had the people paralyzed there. The pools of Bethesda, as I was looking at the archaeological findings, it had five five porches with five roofs. It was essentially in top view a rectangle. Porch to the north, porch to the south, porch to the east, porch to the west, and in the middle there was a porch or a dam, and that's why some would argue it was a, the pools of Bethesda. It was, put, it was put in place under the Greek Empire, under Hellen, Hellenization, and it was a place where the Greeks believed that you could go for healing, and there were many myths and legends. There was a particular god that uh, some believed that if you were able, that he came into this place at a certain time and he would stir up the waters and then serpents would enter the waters. Serpents would enter the waters and that if you could get into the waters first, you would have a dream. And the serpents would give you insights into what your healing was in your dream. And so anciently the people would if you could, go into the waters and you come out, sleep, dream, and you'd be healed. The Bible says in verse 3, in these lay a great multitude of sick people. What kind of sick people, church? Blind, what else? Lame, what else? Paralyzed. And what were they doing? They were waiting, waiting. Now, I'm from Miami, Florida. I said, no amens. I, you know, you know those. <laughs> Amen on your church, you get online. Hey. In the summertime, it's hot. It's not hot. Hot and humid. And when I was uh, in ninth grade, I used to have to take the bus uh, to school. Now, the metro bus... That's the bus you want to take, the city bus. It's air conditioning, and it had a suspension, a suspension system, so when it hits the bumps, it just is very, you know, very soft. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You've been on, you know, like those luxury buses. You know, very, very comfortable ride. And the, and the designers and engineers were thoughtful. What were they, everyone? Thoughtful, because when they designed the seats, they gave enough elbow room for everyone. How many of you like elbow room? There's some countries where they don't like elbow room. And so, 
you got to get to school by 7.30 in the morning. you got to you know, be there on time. The buses run on schedule. Some of you don't, but the buses run on schedule. And if you miss the bus, thank God there was, an, there was another alternative. I would refrain to thank God, but yeah. there was another alternative to get to where you were going. It was called the Jitney. Let me see your hands if you know what the Jitney is. Now, I just, I don't know, I didn't do my research. I don't know who invented deodorant, but I just want to pronounce a blessing <laughs> on that individual or groups of individuals because I think uh, deodorant is, is an excellent device that helps you endure situations when you're pressed together with people. See, I, I like taking showers in the morning. I always did. I put on my deodorant. I get fresh. And in, in Miami in the summertime, in the, even in the morning, it's hot and humid. You can sit there and you'll sweat. If you take, you take a trip to Miami right now and you, you come out of the air and, they, and those sliding doors open, you'll be hit with a wall of humidity. How many of you know what I'm talking about? So the Jitney, there were no engineers that designed the seating arrangement. Just one bench, the metro bus, you have your own seat. The Jitney, there's no bench. You, you get in and you press together. So I get on there, I'm, I'm looking around, I, oh, there's a space in the back. Don't sit in the back in the Jitney. But you go in the back and you sit there and you slide over by the window, you know, it's good. But by the time you get to your desk, your stop, you're like this. And I don't want to, I'm just being graphic for a reason. There, there's, there, there are certain degrees of body odor where you can't think once you smell it. How many of you? Am, am I still telling the truth? You know, there, there's, some, there, 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 there's, there's some situations you're in where you can't even concentrate because the body odor is intense. You can't even pray because the smell has entered it and it has rearranged your frontal cortex and you, 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 you can't even think. You, you're claw, you, you want to claw your way out of this environment, but you can't because there's a, there's a hundred people on this bus, which is the capacity is only 20 people. People sneezing on the bus. You know, you know, come on, you know, COVID. One person sneezes, <gasps> right? I wonder if they got COVID-19. One person sneezes, you know. Sneezing, coughing on the bus. It's hot and humid on the bus. More sneezing and more coughing. Have you been in situations like this before? At 3 o'clock in the morning, I have been in some hospitals in this area. I won't name any. Slice my leg open, my knee. But that's not a serious injury, so what do they do? They put you with all the other sick folk. And if you've been around a lot of sick people, you get scared of catching what they've got. Hmm? That's tell, I'm just going to tell the truth. Some, some of you, you know, happy Sabbath. Just kind of away. Even in your own house, am I telling the truth? The children come and stuff. Mom, give me a hug. No, 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 no. Don't give me a hug. No, no hugs. Not right now. <laughs> I need some distance, but they're your children. Let the parents say amen. 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 I'll say amen for you. They're your children. You brought them in. So they're going to come all over you. And you're dressed, and now you've got stuff, and it's, it's crusty now. You just might as well just take the vitamin C because whatever they got, you've got it now. So if you're a priest, a Levite, a scribe, a Pharisee, a dignified Jew, you are not going to this place. It's the last place you ever want to go, the pools of Bethesda. Can you see it? It's packed tight. Can you see it? It's hot. It's hot and humid. Can you see it? This place has an open roof. That doesn't help. Because when people are, are all over you, this, this, as a matter of fact, we don't want any breeze to carry the odor. <laughs> just just, just stop, the, stop the wind. <laughs> stop talking. On the bus, on the jitney, people talk to you. They talk to you slow, and, and all the words begin with H. <laughs> <sighs> Who invented Colgate? Just, just praise God for Colgate. 
we, we, you know, we, it's got fluoride. We use some other stuff from, from Whole Foods. But thank God for, for things that you can use, mints, Tic Tacs, whatever. But that doesn't, that, people don't want to go there. Bringing a point here. You're here. What I'm saying is you are here in John chapter 5 right now. You're pressed together with all kinds of people, with all their issues, and you can't even move. You're stuck. Are, are, you, are you following me? This is the beginning of problems. It's the beginning of the problems. Because the legend said, the legend, the myth, said that when at a certain time an angel came down, did not say from heaven, Just to be clear, an angel went down. If you, if you look at the architectural drawings of the pools of Bethesda, there were stone steps that went down into the water. And the Bible says that when, at a certain time, an angel came and, what does it say, stirred up the water. Isn't that right? And whoever was what? First. Whoever was what, everyone? First. Is this of God? Does God operate this way? Whoever was first to go down, now I, I, I was doing my studies. Should be, I, I, I broke open all the, 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 the diction, dictionaries, the lexicon, uh, Hebrew culture, all these things. The word stirs up means to trouble with anxiety. Stir up, to make you anxious. And what is anxiety? What is anxiety? Anxiety is when there's something in the future that you absolutely need or, or must have, you don't think you can actually get that thing, so you become stressed about it today. It's different than fear and other things. What is anxiety? Anxiety, anxiety is when there's a job that you want or there's someone you want or something you want, house, job, clothing, what, whatever it may be, you want it or you need it, you need to be healed, but you really don't think you'll be healed, so you worry about it today. Are you still with me? It's anxiety. How many of you have experienced anxiety? How many of you are anxious right now? Don't worry, the sermon, the sermon won't be long. You're like, I hope he doesn't preach too long, but I'm not sure. <laughs> He's anxious today. I, 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 I'm, the Lord's helping me. So, so a messenger, an angel, a messenger, that's what the word angel means. And a messenger would come down and, and agitate the waters, stir it up, and if you were first to get in, that meant that you had to at least be the strongest amongst the weak. You had, at least had to be the strong. Now, that's, that's another paradox. House of mercy, no house of mercy. You're sick, but you at least, in order to get in, you at least needed to be at least stronger than everyone else. So, what are the implications? If, and it says that the angel would come down at a certain time, I was looking it up, it meant at any given time, it was random. So the, an angel would come down and stir up the waters randomly, creating anxiety. And if you were at least the strongest amongst the weak, if you were able to get in first, then you would be healed. So what did that mean? What are the implications? Just setting, setting things up, setting things up for you. That meant that you had to focus on the waters. And it also meant, by the way, there were no latrines, there were no porto potties there. Are you with me? How many want to thank God for porto potties and latrines? Outhouse. Some people I know, they, you know, we'll go to the camp. I'll go into the city, but I'm not going to that latrine. We took certain people camping. <laughs> Three o'clock, I got to go to the bathroom. I got to do number two. I go to the bathroom. And, and don't look. Huh? No latrines. So, if you had to 
focus on the waters and you had to use the bathroom, you couldn't leave. Because no one there is going to hold your spot. So you were created with a dilemma. Oh, what, everyone? I could, I could stay here and do number one or number two where I am, which many people did. Or I could leave. I could somehow muscle my way through the, mul the great multitude of people, use the bathroom and come back, and my place would not be saved. For everyone here, gathered here, getting into the waters was a, listen, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I'm moved by this passage personally because I have felt in my career and in marriage like I was stuck. How many of you can relate? As a matter of fact, it's so, so fascinating. As I was doing this research, I, I found out that many of my coworkers, coworkers, myself included, have expressed the same thing. They can't move. No promotions. The inflation has got, things are becoming more expensive and my salary is not keeping up with inflation. I can't move. There's some people in ministry who have been ministering for a long time. Some of you who hold positions in the church, you've been elders or whatever for a long time, and if you're honest, you're stuck. Some of you in marriage, don't say amen too loud because, you know, I want to create more drama. You've been married for a long time. But you're stuck. You're just as stuck in your marriage. You can't move forward or backwards, up or down. You don't know which way is up. You're just like the man here. And yet many of you, many of, many of us having children. If I could, if they would just only listen. Just don't say, just say amen in your hearts. <laughs> you can't seem to make any progress with them, young or old. Some of you have older children who are not here in church, they're out there, and stuck, stuck. We look at our church today and we see all of the controversy and we're saying, we, we as a church, we, we can't seem to move forward. But God is present here. <laughs> In the midst of all this, oh, this, this confluence of stuff, multitudes pressed together, all this stuff, in the midst of all that is Jesus, the one who created all things. He's right there. That's, that's another paradox. In the midst of all this mess, Jesus is right there in the midst. But you know what? No one notices him because they cannot afford to break focus with the thing that they want. They could not afford focus to they could not afford to break focus. Literally. You have to picture multitudes of people and they're all staring towards the same object. Meanwhile, Jesus is walking in the midst. Because if I look away, the waters might move, and I won't be able to get in, and people will push me out of the way. <laughs> the great irony, and Satan is very clever. The Bible says he's more subtle than any beast of the field that, that God had made. And in the Garden of Eden, there were a multitude of trees, were there not? How many of the trees were they allowed to eat? How much? No, I don't. I know. You know, Adam had abs. Eve had abs. So you know they were. They were. Um, what's the term I'm looking? Um, uh, fit. They didn't. They didn't gorge themselves. But God said, "I'm not going to tell you how much to eat. You. You. You determine that. Of all the trees in the midst of the garden, you may. Come on, sir, church. You may. God said freely, you can have it all. 
But there's one tree. It's not yours. In the midst of the garden, in the middle, there was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of right there, right? But in the course of time, the humans, Adam and Eve were humans, Adam. Eve, the woman, was focused on the tree. And in the course of time, the man became focused on the woman. And everyone lost sight of the one who created the serpent, the tree, and the man and the woman. Are you with me, everyone? Follow me now. At the pools of Bethesda, the serpents would go down into the waters. But in the midst of the pools of Bethesda was the tree of life, Jesus Christ the righteous, which you may freely eat of all his blessings and promises. But the people had made up in their minds that I can't be healed unless I'm healed at this time and at this place with this amount of strength. Verse 5, now a certain man was there who had an infirmity for 38 years. That's a long time. Wouldn't you agree? When Jesus saw him lying there and knew, what did that word say? Did Jesus know that he was there a long time? Is it possible that Jesus knows that you are stuck and have been stuck for a long time? Is it possible that the that the answers to your questions, the solutions to your problem, the cure for your healing has been here all along? Is that a possibility? He knew that he had already had been in that condition a long time. And he said to him, do you want to be made Oh. Now, if you want to start a fight, ask someone in the unemployment line, are you looking for a job? <laughs> Just go to the hospital. Are you, are you looking to be healed? I found it fascinating. Follow me. I found it fascinating that this question, as innocuous as it might seem, was designed by God to do three things. How many things? The first thing it was meant to do was to agitate. Second thing it was meant to do was to redirect. And the third thing it was meant to do was to inspire. What were the three things, everyone? Aha. Uh -huh. You see, the myth was that at a certain time, an angel would go down into the waters and agitate. I'm here to tell you that Jesus has come down to agitate. <laughs> Why? Because this man, like everyone else, was locked into the waters. And how is Jesus going to heal unless he breaks your focus? We, we, each one of us here today, if we're honest, there's something that you've said, if I can just do this at this time, with this amount of strength, I'll be healed. You see, the thing that you've set your mind as a source of healing is also the problem. The pool of Bethesda, which the people said, this will be the solution, it was actually the problem at the same time. So, all the people there were paralyzed, waiting until the, the waters moved. Now, you'll be there a long time. What else is fascinating is, I found out that sometimes the water would stir up, but it would be a false alarm. 
and people would start pushing and shoving. See, if you're locked into the waters, you, you can't afford to take notice of everyone around you. Are you with me? And so you can have a multitude of people going to church, locked in to that thing they, they say is the solution, which is also the problem, and you don't notice all the other church members here. Am I still close to the truth? Because you're locked in. Do you want to be made well? Right? Can you, can you see him? Not, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made? Here's what else I, I found fascinating. Fascinating. Have you ever woke up with a, like a crick in your neck? Have you, have you, haven't you ever gotten a splinter in your finger? <laughs> you see, it is impossible to compartmentalize your life. Are you with me? So if your marriage is suffer suffering, your work is suffering, your parenting is suffering. If you're suffering at work, it affects your parenting and your marriage and your finances. Your finances are messed up, it affects every other area. In other words, we human beings cannot compartmentalize our lives. If one thing is off, it affects the whole. Hmm? So Jesus is still asking, I know that you've got that one problem, but that one problem has now consumed your whole life <laughs> to the extent that you don't even notice that I'm standing right next to you. Do you want to be made whole? Well, the sick man answered, verse 7. Sir, because he doesn't know who this person is. Are you with me? Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred. But while I am coming, what everyone? Doesn't that sound like things people say at work, in the church? I've got no one to help me. Everyone is getting in my way. Oh, some people in the house have said that, you know, washing the dishes, folding the clothes. And da, 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 da. My wife sent me an article. And sometimes when she sends me articles, I'm like, what did I do? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was, a, it was a PDF document. Oh, Lord Jesus. <laughs> but it was, you know, it was, I just want to get your opinion on some things. And it was a, <laughs> which could also be a red herring. It's a, so, so a guy is thinking, hmm, how do I answer this correctly? And the, the essence of the article was a, 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 a mom, wife, who was talking about mental load. She was like, yeah, my husband, he does pick the kids up and drop them off, but, but that's just a small part of it. She said, just the mental load, the mental processing of all the little things that you've got to think about and plan for, that is what weighs me down. There's actually a medical term called um, exhaustion disorder. The glutamine is low. A glutamine. Glutamine. It can make you stressed out. I've got no one to advocate for me. I've got no one to help me. Haven't you said that before? I have no one to help me. How many of you at church board meetings have said, I've got no one to help me? Huh? I'm just telling you what I've heard. I've been, I've been in this church a little, a little, little while. I've heard it in the house, too. I have no one to help me. I'm like, wait a minute. And I just put the dishes away. <laughs> Took out the trash. <laughs> Some of you managers, you have employees. You said it before. It's hard, it's hard to find. No one to help me. All right, I got no one to help me. So, so I'm going to, you know, pull up my boots. And I'm going to make an effort. And when I try to make an effort, guess what? Everybody gets in my way. Literally, 
There's, been, there's a lot of confluation at work, a lot of, a lot of uh, tension because people who just started get promoted to chief and director position. And, and I've heard it, and people, are trying to, you know, people try to be so gracious. Well, you know, I've, I've been working here. I've been working here at this company for 32 years. Got no one to help me. And when I try to make advancement, I keep getting bumped. Have you heard that conversation? Have you heard that speak? And so Jesus, taking all of this into consideration, said, I've heard, I've heard, I know. Here's what I'm going to tell you to do. <laughs> Verse 8, rise. What else, everyone? And do what else? Some of you, I know we're, we're, we're good Christians. And you know, amen, amen. This is absurd. I was going to say it for you. You're like, amen, though, isn't the word, the word of God is powerful. No, this, this, and what Jesus said, is absurd. I'm just going to get it out and relieve the toxins within me. Rise. What else, everyone? Well, brother, sir, if that were possible, I would not be here today. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm here, because I can't take up my bed. Walk. Right? And immediately the man was made well. Immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. We, we, read, we read the Bible, and we read it like we, we really know what's going on. But yeah, no, we don't have a clue. If, hear me out, if God tells you to do something, he, he's already given you the power to do it. God doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't play with your emotions. He's not, you know, Satan is that way. Satan will have you all mixed up. If God says to do something, he has already given you the power to do it. Read Genesis chapter 1. He blessed the birds of the air, saying, fly through the air. God blesses before he empowers. Or I should say, God blesses before he instructs. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you have children? Parents have children. How did your children walk? Did you take their chubby little feet you know, chubby little legs, you know, nice and chunky. You know, did you, you know, when, when they were, did you, did you do this? Okay. Okay, Adrian. Eh? Ah. Hey. Right? Is that how it works? How, how do human beings walk? Come on, some, some, any medical professionals here? How, 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 do, how do little babies walk? You have to admit that God is amazing, that he created 6,000 years of sin. He created us. He, he put it in us to be able to walk. <laughs> but you have to admit that walking is a skill. That if you get into an accident and you have no more use of your legs, and they, they, they work on your lower spine, what have you, and, and now you have to learn to... Follow me. I'm, 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 a do, I'm, I'm doing great on time. Praise God. I'm almost done. Listen. Listen. Walking is an ability that God has given every human being, but it's also a skill. Hmm. Walking is something you learn how to do, an ability that God has already put in you. The thing that hinders you, God has already given you the capacity to do, but it's a skill that you have to develop as you do. I'm going to say it a few more times in different ways. Because I was wrestling with just this thought the whole week. 
He's having a dialogue. Je- listen, Jesus interrupts his focus with an agitating question. And there are many people who agitate you. Just say amen with a lot of amen. amen. Agitate you. Sometimes your children ask you questions that, boy, I... Sometimes your wife asks you questions. Sometimes your husband asks questions. Brother, the cornmeal is on the third shelf. Huh? We've lived in the same house for the 15 years. <laughs> but sometimes questions have to be asked to get us to stop focusing on that thing that we said is the cure, but it's paralyzing. We can't move. You can't grow spiritually. Your marriage can't grow. Parenting is suffering. You, 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 you can't make the right investments. You're just stuck, stuck. They won't promote me at work. Everyone gets in my way. God is saying, hello, I've already given you the power right where you are to stand up and walk. Is it really that simple? Yes, it is. We want to make, we want to make, because we can't explain how God does what he does, we, we got questions about it. You read, I was, uh, Cody Francis was preaching about John chapter 9, one of my other uh, favorite passages a few weeks back. And, 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 and the leadership asked, well, how did he do this? How did he heal you? How many of you know what's in the food that you eat every day? When was the last time you said, I am not going to eat this until you tell me all the ingredients that you put in this? You might be seeing Pastor Conway and Tammy very soon. <laughs> how many of you, question, how many of you have, have traveled by, by plane and you got on the plane and you said, before I take my seat, let me talk to the pilot? How many of you have done that? Just, just anyone? Bravan? Praise God for you, brother. He said, I'm not, I'm not taking my seat till I know. I see his credentials. You see, see, you see, God is God because he's God. Someone put it this way. A, a glass of water, a glass, an empty glass cannot comprehend the ocean, but the ocean can comprehend the glass. So you can take your empty cup and you can dip it into the ocean. Ah, I've got some of the ocean. But the ocean swallows up everything else. Your brain is that little cup. All you can do is dip it into Jesus Christ the righteous. Many of us want to comprehend. You're trying to fit God into your little cups before you take any action. That's the problem. God says, Rise, take up your bed. Now I'm preaching. Rise, take up your bed and walk. In other words, I have already given you the capacity to be a better husband, a better wife, a better investor. Go down the list. I've already given you the capacity, but you can't move because you can't move because you're focused on the wrong thing. Your focus has you paralyzed. Some people are focusing on the on the pastor, and you're saying in your heart, that man can't, this pastor can preach, but some of you say, that man can't preach. Just say amen in your hearts. <laughs> some have, have attended churches, some of certain people have attended churches, and you go into the Sabbath school, and you're like, this is not, that man, woman can't teach Sabbath school. <laughs> Focused on the wrong things. He says to the man, rise. What else, everyone? And what did he do? It, how fast? You can actually immediately begin to do that thing that God has commanded you to do by looking up and standing up right where you are. The man stood up because the place was jam-packed. He lost sight of Jesus. Jesus got lost in the crowd. So being full of joy, as you would be, 
to have this newfound ability, or, or I should say it, it, was, it was given back to you again because you lost that ability. Now God has restored it. You go to the temple, and when the religious people see you on the Sabbath day in the temple, the only question they have They don't, they, they don't care about your past. They don't care about what you've been through. They don't care about the amazing thing that has happened in your life. All they want to know is, why are you carrying this mat? Well, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. The law of Moses says X, Y, and Z. So he has that encounter. And then afterwards, the Bible says that Jesus found him again. <laughs> I'm almost done. Now, how, much, how much more time do I have? I'm almost done. No, 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 it's dangerous. Uh, Jesus went looking for him, that man, knowing that he would not be recognized, healed the man. The man did not know how or who, or who it was by name that healed him. And then Jesus, knowing that, goes back and finds him again to reveal himself. I am the one who healed you. Jesus is the one that heals you. Whether you believe it or not, this story is, is, is our story. What God is saying is that right now, you actually have the, the ability in, internally to begin to walk. Don't tell me you can't preach. That's a skill. Don't tell me you can't teach. That's a skill. Don't tell me you can't manage money. That's a skill. Don't tell me you can't invest money. That's a skill. Don't tell me you can't read. That's a skill. Don't tell me you can't become great. That's a skill. A gift that God has given in you, which you have to develop by standing up and moving forward. See, Christianity is not some mystical, magical thing. Christianity is a skill. Don't tell me you can't be a better husband. That's a skill. Don't tell me. You can get marriage counseling. Amen? It's a skill. You can be a better parent. There are books you can read, seminars you can attend that will give you tools to be a better parent to your children. Huh? And so all of this happens, and here's where we end. With how many how many of you are just thankful for the word of God? But there's something else is that's disturbing about this whole experience as we close. Now, if you had been paralyzed, paralytic, blind, or whatever, for 38 years, and Jesus gave you your sight, do you think people would notice that and rejoice in it? I can read accounts in the Bible where people were healed and they rejoiced and the people took note of it. Why was it that no one took notice of what happened to this man? Come on, speak to me, church. Why was it that no one took notice of Jesus and this miracle that happened to this man in Jerusalem on the Sabbath day in this place? Why was it? Looking at the wrong place. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, God healed the man in the midst of a multitude and no one took notice. This man was able to, to squeeze him. I see him. I see him. He, he's, he's like, pardon me, pardon me, pardon me. You know, when you can start walking, you start high-stepping now. Pardon me, pardon me, right? Excuse me. No one notices because they're looking at the waters. Pardon me. No one says, hey, aren't you that brother that, first of all, because they're so focused in, they don't even know how long, they don't even know what he's wearing. Could it be that people gather in churches all over the time, some people are being healed and walk right out of the church, and no one takes notice that God has performed a miracle in their lives? (laughs) Just another Sabbath service, just, you know, 
Meanwhile, people are getting healed in churches. And God is doing amazing things. But because we're so focused in, I can't believe she said what he said. I can't believe this. I can't believe that. We don't even notice that God had, was in the place healing people. And, and we, we, we take no notice of it. <laughs> but God, he, he did all this to come down to stir up the waters. You see, what happened here to this man began to agitate a whole lot of people. <laughs> see, that's what we need today. We need God through his, through his spirit to agitate us. That whatever, whatever you've been thinking about so much that has consumed, literally consumed your mind, God, God says, hey, hey, I'm right here. Can we have a conversation? Can, can you just, before you rush off to work, before you get on, online, can we just talk a little while in the morning? I got something to tell you. What do you want to tell me, Lord? Rise, take up your bed and walk. How are you going to do that? <laughs> there you go again, trying to fit the ocean into your cup. I'm so excited today to tell you that God has not changed. He literally is the same yesterday, same today, and the same. What he did here, doing now. What you don't realize is that God has already sent his guardian, your guardian angel, to sit right next to you in this church right now. You can't see them, but they're here right now. Amen. Hmm? Do you believe that? I know. Yeah, I believe that. But do you, have you embraced that truth? Because if you embraced it, your life would change immediately. Our churches would change immediately because the church is made up of people, people who believe in God. When you have a group of people who believe in God who's there, then you have a church that's on fire that now goes throughout the world and we begin to agitate. We begin to break people's fo focus, turning them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God. How many of you want to say, Lord, break my focus? <laughs> break my focus. Even if I'm agitated, God will still sit there and listen to you. Aren't you happy? You can talk to God in prayer and just, you know, I'm just tired of this foolishness. I, and, God, and, and Jesus will listen to your complaints because he knows what you've been going through. He knows you've been in that condition a long time. And, he's, and you can see his face. He's got a, a kind of a, a smirk on it. Not a smirk, but he's like, I got something in store for you. And the man can see it. He's like, hmm. Hmm. Get up. You don't belong here. You don't belong in this place. These serpents can't help you. These waters can't help you. Only I can help you. Let's, let's pray. Father in heaven, we believe it. Help thou our unbelief. Father, there are things in our lives that we've said we can't afford to look away from because we might miss our opportunity. But you are our opportunity. Do whatever it takes to break our focus, Lord Jesus, so that in response to your command, we will discover that you've already given us the capacity to walk. How? We don't know. It doesn't matter. We don't need a long explanation. All we need to know is that you've given us the command. So, Father, thank you for your beautiful children here. Those watching online, help us not just tuck this lesson aside. Help us put it into practice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.